Our previous video on Ukrainian usage of HIMARS launchers ended stressing the importance of good targeting info. Frontline info is easier to come by if one has good enough sensors, enough troops and so on. But knowing what's going on behind enemy frontlines, where are the supply point and command nodes, that can be hard. Ukraine has little means of doing such behind-the-line recon on its own. Info from spies and sympathizers on the ground is occasional and far from guaranteed. As per admissions of officers within Ukraine's own air force, Russia took advantage of the consolidated frontlines and set up an air defense network which largely negates drone usage even over the front, let alone usage where dozens of miles need to be crossed deep into enemy-held ground with any sort of an aircraft. So the crucial part of the GMLRS usage in Ukraine is NATO's own target finding and sharing of information. That's not a new thing. From the moment the war started, NATO has been sharing information with Ukraine. In the initial stages of the war, NATO AWACS planes could monitor airspace hundreds of miles into Ukraine, while not crossing the border. Warnings of incoming Russian Air Force attacks were frequent. It's one of the reasons Ukraine's Air Force survived for as long as it did, instead of being destroyed completely on the ground outright. Large formations of Russian ground troops were easily tracked and Ukrainian troops could form defense points and even ambushes, using shared intelligence, as Russia was rushing headlessly deep towards Kiev. But this current stage of the war requires targeting data that's a bit harder to acquire. Still, it seems NATO is trying their hardest to provide that as well. The former US Defense Secretary and former CIA Director Leon Panetta said, we are providing intelligence on targeting for artillery and other systems that Ukrainians are using. Ukrainians then decide how to use weapons and what targets to fire at. An example of that was the row over US helping Ukraine kill Russian generals. The US denied it told Ukraine to kill Russian generals, and there is an administrative ban on providing precision targeting intelligence for senior Russian leaders by name. But the definition of that ban suggests the timely location info on Russian officers may still be shared as long as it doesn't contain exact names. The US has also at one point during the war updated its intelligence sharing guidelines to help Ukraine conduct offensive operations specifically inside the Donbas region. Way back in March, White House official Jen Psaki said US was sharing real-time intelligence assisting Kiev in order to inform and develop the Ukrainian military response to Russia. Unofficially, that info includes information on Russian force movements and locations. Allegedly intercepted communications are also shared, and the info is shared 30 to 60 minutes after the US receives it. The US admitted it helped identify and provide targeting info for the sinking of the Moskva cruiser, for example. Finally, the director of the US Defense Intelligence Agency, Lt. Gen. Barrier, said sharing of information between the US and Ukraine is revolutionary in terms of what they can do. Gen. Nakasoni, head of the NSA, said he has in his 35-year career never seen better sharing of accurate, timely and actionable intelligence than what is happening in Ukraine. So it is not a surprise that the GMLRS missiles in Ukraine have lots of important targets on their list, and that the said list has been compiled by veteran military professionals, acting on a vast intelligence dataset provided by the might of NATO's recon hardware. Ukraine's own commanders then get to pick and choose which targets to strike in which order. As said, NATO's intelligence gathering hardware is considerable. NATO is flying various aircraft near Ukraine's borders nearly all the time. There were days when six different NATO planes flew missions. Unlike the sensors Ukraine's drones have, some of these aircraft can see hundreds of miles away. For example, the U-2 spy planes have been flying daily from Fairford in the UK. Flights from Akritori in Cyprus also happen regularly. Of course, it's noticeable that due to geography, the eastern part of the front is not as well covered as is the area around Kherson and Crimea, which is why targets in those areas might be harder to hide for Russia. Then there are of course satellites. Ukraine was in talk with Maxar company for access to their commercial imagery, but that's of little consequence when the US has been buying commercial imagery for military ops for some years now. The combined fleet of US-owned commercial and government satellites that could gather tactical information is huge, with access to 34 optical satellites with resolution of half a meter or better. 
and even satellites of poorer resolution can also be useful for tracking once a higher resolution satellite first identifies a target. List presented is not exhaustive. But even with such a number of satellites available, any sort of a fixed target such as a depot in use is basically impossible to hide. And even relocatable targets such as vehicles can sometimes be tracked on a near hourly basis during daytime and fair weather. Interesting comments were recently made by Ukrainian Major General Vadim Skibetsky. Not only did he claim HIMARS were used based on excellent satellite imagery and real-time information, but he also said there was consultation between US and Ukrainian intelligence officers before strikes were performed. While he said the US was not providing direct targeting information, he did say the US effectively had veto powers over what target could be engaged. It is therefore likely that fruitful attacks with GMLRS missiles will keep happening for as long as there is targeting info available and for as long as Ukrainian military is careful enough not to use the launchers too close to the front lines.